Welcome back. This is an example of how to tune a DC brushless motor from scratch. This example assumes that you have already tuned other parameters required to run a motor, such as the output control mode of your access interface card, any ADC offset calibrations, motor phasing, current loop tuning, and that sort of thing. If you haven't already set these up or you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, please refer to the motor setup video tutorials before proceeding. I have a low voltage 24 volts DC brushless motor by Shinano Kenshi, part number LA052. Has 2000 counts per revolution. Encoder, digital A quad B encoder, and can handle about 4 amps continuous and 8 amps peak. I'm also using a 3U042 Delta Tau digital direct PDM amplifier with a bus voltage of 48 volts DC. To access the interactive tuning environment, within the IDE, click on Tools and then go to Tune. I'll expand this. I'll be using Motor 3. We want to click on Position Loop Interactive Tuning and then click on Step. The goal is to first use step move to tune proportional gain, KP, derivative gain, KVFB, and integral gain, KI. We want to increase KP until it overshoots and oscillates about the target step size. You specify the target step size right here. This needs to be between one quarter and one half revolution of the motor, if you have a rotary motor, or one quarter to one half the electrical cycle length if you have a linear motor. Since my encoder is 2,000 counts per revolution, and it's a rotary motor, I'll select a step size of 1,000 counts. This keeps the motor within its linear region, allowing us to more easily estimate the PID parameters, or the proportional integral derivative gain parameters. Now these steps are applicable to any type of DC brushless or DC brush motor, since they're tuned quite similarly, but the magnitude of the gains that you select will vary. For a motor my size that is unloaded, I'll be choosing proportional gains between 0 and 100, derivative gains between 0 and 2,000, acceleration feed forward gains on the order of 10,000, friction feed forward gains between 0 and 1,000, and velocity feed forward gains between 0 and 2,000. Now depending on your loading and the capacity of your motor and amplifier, the magnitudes could vary quite a bit, so you want to start by inputting very small gain values if you don't know where to start. Using the position loop auto tuner can give you a good starting place if you can move the motor safely, but if you don't want to use the auto tuner, then you want to start with very small values of KP. You always turn KP first before moving on to the derivative gain. Keep in mind that before you start tuning, you do want to connect the load because the load will affect the gains that you need to properly tune the motor. But for demonstration purposes and safety, I'm tuning without load. The process is the same, however. Since I know from experience that a motor this size takes proportional gain values between 0 and 100, I'll start with a pretty conservative value of 2. And we can do a step move and see where we are. We can see that the motor actual position in green is overshooting and oscillating the commanded position in red just like we wanted. But the natural frequency is quite poor. For an unloaded motor, I should be able to achieve a natural frequency of 25 Hz or greater. The natural frequency, also known as the bandwidth, dictates how fast you can actually move the motor. For heavily loaded systems or poor mechanics, you should expect a natural frequency of about 12 Hz or less. But since I know I can do better, I'll increase the KP, and since I know this will increase the oscillations quite a bit, I'll add a derivative gain as well. I know from experience that the derivative gain should be on the order between 0 and 2000, so I'll add a pretty conservative value of 250, just to prevent the motor from oscillating completely out of control and damaging something. 
Generally speaking, you do want to add derivative gain as you continue to increase Kp. Now this is a fairly good response. Right now I have 21.4% overshoot, and it is oscillating about and then settling directly at the commanded position. This is pretty good, but I would like to get a smaller overshoot and a larger natural frequency. To improve natural frequency, I want to increase proportional gain, and to improve overshoot, I want to increase derivative gain. Bandwidth is basically proportional to your proportional gain, Kp. So since I want to essentially double my bandwidth, or my natural frequency, I'll basically double my proportional gain. Let's set it equal to something like 25. But since I know that setting the proportional gain this high will cause much higher frequency oscillations, I want to make sure I damp them out by essentially changing the derivative gain by the same factor that I changed the proportional gain. Let's set it equal to something like 750. Now this is quite a good response. I have no overshoot, meaning that the motor essentially goes right to its target and does not go over it. And my natural frequency is has more than doubled, meaning that I have a much better bandwidth, I can move the motor much more quickly. But this diagram has a slight problem. There is some steady state error. You can see that once the motor has settled, its actual position is slightly different than the commanded position. So we want to try to eliminate that by either increasing Kp, your proportional gain, or increasing your integral gain, or a combination of the two. Let's start by slightly increasing the proportional gain, setting it equal to 30. We see that we've benefited ourselves by increasing the natural frequency by quite a bit, and the position error is almost completely eliminated. There is very, very little steady state error, but we've also introduced quite a bit of high frequency oscillation after it's settled. We can try eliminating that by backing off a little bit on the derivative gain. Let's try setting an equal to 700. And now we've achieved exactly what we want. Natural frequency of 28.44 hertz, much better than we started. We have zero steady state error. You can see that the actual position and the commanded position are essentially exactly the same after the motors come to rest. And we have introduced a very slight overshoot, 1.8%, but for most applications that's completely fine. Depending on your application, that may not be acceptable, but for most applications, 1.8% overshoot, overshoot is quite fine. So now that we have finished tuning our proportional gain and our derivative gain, we want to decide whether we need any integral gain. For this particular case, we don't need it at all. We've achieved a high frequency, low overshoot, minimal rise time response. If you have a lot of friction or uh, gravitational effects in your axis, however, you may need integral gain, Ki. For example, if you're tuning a vertical axis on a machine tool, you will definitely need to incorporate some integral gain. Start at a very small value, such as 0 0.0001, set your integration mode equal to zero, such that it is always active, and keep increasing integral gain by increments of 0 0.0001 until you get a desired response. Be very careful with the integral gain because it can quickly destabilize the system. Generally speaking, you don't want to go greater than 0 0.01 unless you have a lot of body forces. So now that we've finished tuning Kp, Kvfb, and Ki for the proportional derivative and integral gains, respectively. With the step move, we want to move on to tuning velocity feed forward, KVFF, acceleration feed forward, KAFF, and friction feed forward, KFFF. We do this through the parabolic velocity move. Select that tab. For the move parameters, you want to select a move size and a time that simulates a harsh move condition, that is, one of the most difficult moves you expect this motor will ever need to achieve. If we tune in these circumstances, we know that easier circumstances will be simple for the motor. 
In other words, worst case scenario tuning will easily handle your normal case or your marginal case. We want to start by setting our velocity feed forward to the recommended starting point, which is setting it exactly equal to your derivative gain. And then we'll click on do a parabolic velocity move. We always want to tune velocity feed forward first before we move on to the other gains. We see in this particular case, we actually don't need to modify velocity feed forward. Its starting value of being set equal to derivative gain works just fine. We know this because there is no rounding in the left and right portions of the response. We are examining the following error and how it compares to the commanded velocity. We see that the following error dips down in a ramp like that on the left side, and then on the way back it, it slants up on a ramp. If we had seen any curvature in the left or right portions of the graph, we would know that we need to increase or decrease velocity feed forward. If you saw curvature that's the same shape as the commanded velocity, you know you need to increase velocity feed forward. If it is the inverse shape, you need to decrease velocity feed forward. For more information, see the part of this tutorial where we explain the tuning concepts and the effect of each gain. In this particular case, since we see a downward ramp on the left side of the graph and an upward ramp on the right side of the graph, we know we need to increase acceleration feed forward to bring the ramp on the left side down to a flat spot and the ramp on the right side up to a flat spot. And then we can increase friction feed forward to bring those flat spots to zero. Let's start by setting acceleration feed forward. Acceleration feed forward, you can typically change in large amounts without a lot of fear of destabilization. From experience, I know that these little motors take about 5,000 and 60,000, so let's start toward the lower end and set it equal to 10,000. We see that that has definitely made a good effect. The ramps have been brought closer to zero, but we've actually inverted the ramps a little bit so that now it's pointing up on the left and down on the right. We don't want that, so we'll back off a little bit on the acceleration feed for it. This has made a good effect. We can see that the ramps are essentially completely gone. If you average the shape of the following error response, then it's basically a flat spot above zero on the left half of the graph and a flat spot below zero on the right half of the graph. To eliminate these, we should increase friction feed forward, which will bring the left flat spot down towards zero and the right flat spot up towards zero. A good place to start with friction feed forward is about 100. This has clearly brought the flat spots closer to zero, but we have a little ways to go, so let's double that amount. Now we see that both of those flat spots are essentially right around zero, and this is an example of a fairly well done parabolic velocity move. We see that the maximum following error is only about 5 counts, which is merely a percentage of total 2,000 counts per revolution resolution of our encoder. And the following error is centered about zero. It oscillates a little bit, but it's mostly centered about zero. So this is an example of a pretty well-tuned parabolic velocity response. And we achieved it by first setting our velocity feed forward equal to the derivative gain, then modifying our acceleration feed forward to eliminate the ramp-like shape of the falling error, and then we modified friction feed forward to bring the flat spots close to zero. Now before we finish, just want to point out the difference between derivative gain 1 and 2 and velocity feed forward gain 1 and 2. KVFB is used for better trajectory tracking control when there is not a lot of disturbances in the system. If, however, you have a lot of random noise or bumps to the system that would confuse the servo loop, you want to use KVIFB, which is better for disturbance rejection. It's the same thing with KVFF and KVIFF. KVFF is better for trajectory tracking without disturbances. KVIFF is better for eliminating 
disturbances, if you expect disturbances in the system.